50 years ago, an airplane took off in California, and the concept of air travel would never be the same. The DC-3, the plane that helped the airlines grow and taught the public to fly, that helped win World War II and lived on to perform service around the world today. Come meet that airplane, the DC-3, and the people behind it. Emergency exit light, arm, thrust computer, set for takeoff, spoiler handle, it's arm. The cockpit of a DC-10 with its three-member flight crew. As the huge 250-ton jet moves toward the runway at Boston's Logan Airport, its crew runs through their usual pre-flight checklist. They're on and check. Supplies. Set, Dozens of systems are checked and checked again to ensure that this product of modern technology is ready to fly. But suddenly, across the field like a phantom out of time, a little twin propeller DC-3 scurries by. And in its cockpit, its two-man crew is engaged in its own pre-flight check. vision from another age, but still a very real part of the working scene today. A living reminder that this 50-year-old classic is the grandfather to today's modern behemoths. As the DC-10 crew maneuvers closer to the runway, they check through their final items. Takeoff PA, it's on. Takeoff checklist is complete. And soon behind it, its little ancestor also falls into position. Oh, looking good. Final four to go. Okay. This jet age giant carrying nearly 300 passengers, a testament to the modern era of commercial transport. But air travel today, so much a part of our lives. It's easy to forget in many ways it all started only 50 years ago, here in the DC-3. The plane that made it possible. The plane that helped the airlines grow and taught the public to fly. And now, in its 50th anniversary year, through the winds of history, that very plane has emerged, still playing a bright, active role in our world today. There's possibly no finer tribute for the DC-3, the plane that changed the world. From here in Anchorage, Alaska, DC-3s are being used today by a company named Salair Air Cargo. Their mission is to fly to remote landing strips and pick up fish for processing back in the city. Bill Hartman is a retired United Airlines pilot, currently flying two of Salair's DC-3s. I uh, flew with United Airlines for 36 years, flying the various airplanes which they had. I ended up retiring from the 747 airplane. Captain Hartman originally flew DC-3s with United back in the early 40s. When you first get back in an airplane like this out of jets, it does seem a bit old-fashioned. Once you're in it again, it becomes as rock solid as it was before, and you like the sound and the feel, and it feels very comfortable and very, very home-like again. It's really a home in the air. And the sounds and feel of this airplane is it's old-fashioned, but at the same time, it's never old either. You never get tired of it. It uh, makes music as you fly, almost. Salair's headquarters are found south of here, in the shadows of Mount Rainier in Seattle, Washington. It was several years ago when this unusual operation got started. But my point is this, somebody has to do the marketing here as well as in Vancouver, because the... Joe and Edie Salerno retired from long flying careers with Pan Am back in 1977. Today, they're running their own airline, along with their sons, Bruce and Paul. John's gonna market. But back when they retired, Edie and Joe were off to spend their lives touring America in their Airstream trailer. Fine, all right. Great. Okay, it's decided. What do you think, Dave? Salair originally started in 1979 when I got a job uh, hauling fish as a co-pilot mechanic on a DC-3 in Alaska. I learned a lot about the business that first summer 
And then the summer of 1980, I had graduated from college, and my brother Bruce and I were discussing what we were going to do with our lives. And we came to a determination that if anybody at all could make a success of running an old airplane in cargo operations, both of us being pilots and both of us being mechanics, we would be able to do it. Bruce suggested that we purchase a DC-3 and take it to Alaska and haul fish. We knew that we could not get our folks approval on something like this, so we waited until my, uh, they had gone on an extended vacation, and we searched the west coast and found in Oakland uh, our first DC-3 aircraft. So one day we called home and the boys said, things are going great. And we said, well, what's happening? And they said, well, uh, we bought an airplane today. And we said, an airplane? How big? Thinking maybe it was like a Cessna or something like this. And they said, well, uh, we bought a DC-3. So when we returned, they greeted me with, well, Dad, here's the, tea, here's the key to the airplane. I says, you've got to be crazy. Do you have any spare parts? They said, no. Do you have any uh, spare money? No. Do you have a spare engine? No. So I walked off and didn't talk to him for three weeks. He was pretty upset. <laughs> we tried to get my dad to come to Alaska initially, our first summer in 1980, but he was not interested and not receptive to the idea. However, when we did get back in September and paid off a substantial portion of our initial debt, uh, he was quite pleased. I started to work for him full time sometimes six days, seven days a week. We did all the maintenance, we did all the repair work, and the boys did all the flying. And their work paid off. Today, with 11 DC-3s, they've expanded beyond their summertime Alaska operation to year-round contracts with several large air freight carriers. Salair takes cargo from these large jets in Seattle and flies it to smaller airports, where it makes sense to operate planes which cost only $125,000. We couldn't stay in business if we were using an airplane that cost a million to a million and a half dollars. Uh, it's not economical. Uh, they can carry 7,500 pounds of uh, freight and they can sit uh, at, at a position and wait for five or six hours for the return trip. Whereas you can't not do it with a, a large one million dollar airplane. I attribute the, uh, our success in this field not only to a lot of hard work by ourselves, but to Donald Douglas, who back in 1930s designed an airplane that just couldn't be beat. An airplane that today Captain Hartman is flying to the small Alaskan village of Tyonic, where it will set down on a gravel strip. With its strong landing gear, and its unique abilities to set down on short, rough airstrips and to carry tremendous loads. It's an ideal way to move fish from remote locations. As the village fishermen gradually come in with their salmon, the plane can just sit and wait without costing Salair a fortune. The fish is loaded into boxes, which are put aboard the plane to fly out for processing. With the plane's great space and ability to carry one-third of its own weight in cargo, these 3,000 pounds of salmon are soon on their way to Anchorage and then on to the tables of the world. Fifty years after its creation, the DC-3 is still on the job, doing what it's always done best, performing ruggedly and dependably, making money for its operators, indeed putting them in business and keeping them there. An impressive feat for an airplane one might expect to find only in a museum. Deservedly, the DC-3 can be found in a museum as well, at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., where Peter Brooks is a visiting scholar in aircraft structure and design. The DC-3 certainly was uh, a force that changed the world in its time, and the reason for that, I think, is that it really made serious commercial air transport possible. It was the first air vehicle which really offered prospects of making money out of it commercially while satisfying a public demand for common carriage. In the early part of this century, engineers were struggling heroically to master the elements of flight. A flying machine is a delicate balancing act between competing forces assembled into a package that will preferably stay in one piece. Thrust from the engine pulls the structure forward. 
lift from the wings is supposed to pull the structure upwards. Drag from the air rushing past stubbornly opposes our intrepid flyer's forward motion. And finally, there's gravity. The Wright brothers were the first to solve this equation of forces for powered flight. On December 17, 1903, their machine stayed up for 12 full seconds. Progress came quickly. By 1909, they were demonstrating a twin-engine catapult-launched tube and canvas machine in sustained flight. The Wright brothers used the new science of aerodynamics to pull their flyer into the air. Every airplane designer has to understand how a particular shape called an airfoil will generate lift as the airstream is forced to flow more rapidly over the long upper surface. World War I, airplanes found their first widespread practical use. The aerobatics of dogfighting became a familiar image, but airplanes were still inefficient machines. These biplanes were burdened with 200-pound engines producing only 150 horsepower, so speeds were slow. Slow speed means low lift, only enough in this case to carry the plane and two people aloft. The struts and wires produced high drag. Trying to increase speed to get more lift, drag would increase as well. But in the post-war years, aerodynamic victories were about to change the world. The Europeans were first to start a system of mail and passenger services, by late 1919, flying daily between London and Paris. Larger planes were essential, and four key technical areas were being tackled. Structures, aerodynamics, engines, and instruments. Development went ahead in those four areas at a pace which resulted in a level of technology by 1935 which could be incorporated in the DC-3. In structures, the crucial advance was the step from externally braced biplanes with their struts and wires to the cantilever or internally braced monoplane. There was an immediate reduction in weight and in air resistance or drag. With drag reduced, for a given engine power, the aircraft could fly faster, generate more lift, and carry a greater load, maybe even a paying load. And the passengers did pay. European governments subsidized air travel, but you still had to be rich to fly. It was an experience far above the reach of the average citizen. But as more Europeans flew, the public became aware of airplane capabilities and limitations. In the early 20s, pilots could fly only in good weather. They navigated by visual reference with just a map to guide them. Navigational instruments were needed, but not yet available. Without visible landmarks below, they couldn't fly. For the European public, this could mean delayed or diverted service. In America, there was virtually no passenger service. The post office was first to find a use for planes, establishing airmail in 1918. And several fledgling airlines began to make their living in the 20s from government mail contracts. Flying in all weather, day and night, with primitive instruments and numerous crashes, the public was convinced flying was a dangerous business. But one airmail pilot, Charles Lindbergh, changed the public's perception. It was 1927. Flying nonstop across the Atlantic in nearly 24 hours, he fired the public imagination with thoughts of safe long-distance travel. And as ideas about flying were changing, so was airplane technology. That same year, the Lockheed Vega appeared. With several remarkable features, it used, like Lindbergh's plane, a lightweight air-cooled radial engine, the high technology of the 20s. This engine made possible a, a, a very much more efficient airplane because the weight of the airplane was reduced in going from the heavy old engines to these new air-cooled radials. The power developed was enormously increased and the reliability and economy of operation of the engines all were greatly improved. The first Vegas flew at 135 miles per hour with considerable drag from the blunt surface of the radial engine. But the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, the forerunner of NASA, created a streamlined engine cowling that reduced drag to such an extent that speed was immediately increased by 20 miles per hour. The gifted designer of the Vega was Jack Northrop, whose innovations would later be used in the DC-3. 
His Vega was an all-wood structure, and it introduced the stressed skin monocoque fuselage, which was a shell-like body with its strength contained in the outer skin itself, much like an egg. Stressed skin was a major advance. It made possible a space-filled interior with much less weight than this cluttered conventional girder-type construction. The Vega could hold six passengers who were offered greater distances and speed by its improved engine, streamlined design, and lightweight structure. The technology was coming together, and by the early 30s, public confidence in flying was on the rise. Aviation heroes and improvements in airplanes had convinced people that flying could be reliable, practical, enjoyable, and possibly even safe. Since the mid-20s, pilots had kept in radio contact with controllers on the ground, but now there was a revolutionary new flying aid, radio signals that kept a plane on an exact course. The signals were emitted from a network of ground stations. Planes could now fly in heavy cloud conditions and at night, and could be scheduled on a regular basis. So, by the early 30s, technology had made important strides. Engines, greater horsepower with lighter weights. Structures, greater strength and more room inside. Aerodynamics, streamlining and higher speed. And instruments, all-weather day and night flying. And these advances were beginning to reshape public attitudes. Flying was no longer considered an activity exclusively for madmen or heroes and the average person began to entertain the notion as a distant personal possibility. While more people were flying, the total number was still small. The Great Depression was on and air travel was expensive. Passenger capacity on the planes was tiny and the airlines eked out a profit only from the government subsidy they received for the mail they carried. Then, tragedy for the airlines, 1931. A TWA wood and metal Fokker trimotor flying into severe icing in Kansas crashed. Among the wreckage, inspectors found signs that the wooden ribs of a wing had been rotting. One of its passengers was Newt Rockney, the beloved coach who had put his Notre Dame team on the map. As the nation mourned his loss, the Civil Aeronautics Authority drafted new regulations for the inspection of wooden aircraft. It was a turning point beyond which the commercial aircraft then being used had no future. Jack Fry was TWA Vice President of Operations, and he faced a dilemma. He needed something better than the wood structure Fokker, and his competitor United Airlines was proudly introducing the all-metal Boeing 247. It was a stressed skin monoplane with two cowled engines, faster than the Fokker by 70%. Although the 247 represented the first truly modern plane of its era, the design contained shortcomings. It had only 10 seats, and the cabin was obstructed by two wing spars across the aisle. In any case, the initial production of the Boeing was earmarked for United Airlines, Jack Fry's rival, so he could not obtain them. The best he had available was the much slower all-metal Ford Trimotor. TWA did the best it could to convince the public of the Ford's acceptability. TAT was the forerunner company to TWA, and it ran a combined transcontinental air rail service by rail at night when things were dark and dangerous, and by air in the day when planes were fit to fly. The big tri-motor all-metal plane is ready and waiting, equipped like a Pullman car. Its roomy cabin is well lighted and heated in wintertime. Seated in our comfortable chairs, we are all set now to see America best. The field rushes by, then all is flowing smooth. But any early traveler on these flights might recall some truer details. Tommy Tomlinson was a naval test pilot who came to work as technical assistant to Jack Fry at TWA. He had flown hundreds of hours in the Ford Trimotors. Flying in the old Fords and Fockers was really a, almost an ordeal from a passenger standpoint. They, uh, the, the planes were extremely noisy. There was vibration. The, uh, Ventilation, heating during cold weather was spasmodic and uh, not too well controlled. They, uh, for a transcontinental flight, it was uh, almost deafening. That is, a person would make a flight, particularly in the old all metal Ford, which shivered and shook, rattled, and the noise of the engines, you'd be almost deaf for a couple of days after you arrived at your destination. Plane from 
from New York and the East, arriving 420 on time. I always was surprised that people would pay the money to ride in the things. And with the Depression on, not that many people were paying the money to fly in them. We were lucky to have six or seven passengers out of the possible 12, and usually out of the six or seven, half of them would be deadheads. They would be for publicity purposes or friends of somebody or other. The airlines faced bankruptcy. They had to have a completely new airplane that would carry more passengers, carry them faster, with dependability and the potential of making money. Jack Fry was desperate for something better than the Fords, and with a Boeing 247 unavailable, he wrote a letter to five airplane manufacturers of the time, a letter that would change aviation history. He requested them to design a plane which would surpass the Boeing and would take fullest advantage of the best technology of the day. In Santa Monica, Donald W. Douglas was one of the recipients of Jack Fry's letter. Douglas was one of the better known aviation designers at the time, and his small company had primarily been manufacturing military planes. Arthur Raymond was assistant chief engineer in the shop in those days, soon to become one of the principal designers of the DC-1, 2, and 3 series. When we received the letter from Jack Fry, Doug called in the design team, and within, I would say, a week, we had the uh, three-view drawing made. We had performance estimates made. We knew about cost and delivery. And we were ready to submit the proposal. The team's proposal was for a bimotor, not the tri-motor Fry had asked for. It was an important departure from the original request. We disliked the idea of a tri-motor so much that we never even considered it. The nose engine and the tri-motors in my opinion, was a curse. It introduced into the structure of the fuselage and the passenger cabin the unpleasantness of vibration, noise, odor, and the hazard of fire. But Fry had requested three engines for a reason. At the time, pilots were used to flying tri-motors, which gave them a sense of security. If one engine failed in flight at high altitude, there were still two others to get them down safely. Charles Lindbergh was a technical advisor to TWA. Shown here inspecting an engine factory, he was especially concerned with issues of engine reliability. For the new design, he insisted on an airplane that could meet the strict test of being able to cross the Rockies, the highest part of TWA's route, at a safe altitude with one engine dead. It was a challenge for the Douglas team who proposed a large plane with only two engines. But aware of the increases in engine horsepower, the advances in streamlining and aerodynamics, the invention of instrument aids, they had faith in their design, which rapidly brought together the best advances of the past decade. Once we had the preliminary design done, I was chosen as assistant chief engineer to go east to New York and confer with TWA together with Harry Wetzel, who's our executive vice president and business manager. We decided, because there had been quite a number of airline accidents about that time, and because we really wanted to get there, to go by train. My discussions were mainly with Lindbergh, who in general seemed to be favorably inclined, except that he was worried about the single engine flight problem. Tell the truth, I was too. But in spite of my skepticism, I was optimistic. And we were all optimistic, because by golly, we wanted to do it. And within a few months, they were doing it. A contract was signed and the Douglas Commercial One, or the DC-1, was underway. But throughout construction, the team worried whether the recently available more powerful engines could really do the job to lift this large 12-passenger plane and meet Lindbergh's one-engine-out test. 
Two engines from different manufacturers were being considered for the contract. The Wright Company Cyclone, 710 horsepower, in testing was experiencing cylinder cooling problems. And the Pratt & Whitney Hornet, 700 horsepower, which was having trouble with oil consumption. These engines represented the latest improvements in power plant technology, the most advanced horsepower of their day. After intense testing, the contract went to the Wright Company, which at the last moment redesigned the cylinders, although in later years, Pratt & Whitney won back the business. Meanwhile, at the other end of Los Angeles, Bailey Oswald was involved with developments taking place at Caltech. In Pasadena, a new 200 mile per hour wind tunnel was being used in the developing science of aerodynamics. A surprisingly simple device, still in use today, it offered a more direct approach to design than the theoretical charts and graphs which had been used previously. Bailey Oswald was a recent graduate here when he was hired by Arthur Raymond to run the original tests on the DC-1, 2, and 3 series. Starting with the DC-1, I think that we began to bring aerodynamics out into the open and make it all-inclusive, important asset to the airplane. And it happened, in fact, that I came in 1932 and was a single aerodynamics in the company at that time. And uh, as time went on, uh, the aerodynamics section was built up to, during the wartime, I believe as many as 200 people. The DC-1, 2, and 3 were each aerodynamically tested in the same way. A model was hung upside down in the tunnel to make it easier for the aerodynamicists to make their measurements. A fan in the tunnel generates wind. And as air flows over the wings, its aerodynamic lift will be in a downward direction towards the tunnel floor. As it flies, it pulls down on the wires supporting it. These wires extend through the tunnel ceiling into a balance room above, where they are attached to a series of scales. Each scale measures a different force on the model. For example, lift, drag, thrust. And once the model stabilizes in the wind, the aerodynamicist collects the data in the form of a numerical readout on each scale, ultimately translating those readouts into finely tuned graphs and equations which will modify design. As a result of these kind of wind tunnel tests, we learned many things that we took advantage of during the design. In order to make it possible for this airplane to fly well, we used a very good shaping on the fuselage carrying out that fine end at the rear, a uh, nat sloping streamlined windshield, monoplane wing, streamlined tail surfaces, cantilever type, and ACA low drag cowling on the engines, and retracted landing gear. These streamlining features were refined in the wind tunnel, and the original test reports shown here are from the early 30s. From that time on, no plane would be designed without aerodynamic wind tunnel testing. We didn't depend upon calculations alone because the design parameters weren't well established at that time. But we did make physical tests of practically everything. Weights were applied to determine the strength of various parts. The wing and body proved to be especially tough, a hallmark of the DC-1, 2, and 3 series. The wing was an idea borrowed from Jack Northrup, who had designed the Vega. Its all-metal, multicellular structure placed individual sections together in a grid-like fashion, building a single unit stronger than its parts. It was lightweight, but extremely strong. A stressed skin fuselage design was used, just as in Northrop's wooden Vega. But now the construction was done entirely with new aluminum alloys, which combined lightweight and great strength. In July of 1933, Jack Fry got what he wanted 10 months after the contract was signed. There was quite a group of us there. And when that airplane came out, it just amazed us. And we were delighted and figured that we really had something for the future. With Tommy Tomlinson aboard as co-pilot, the plane soon successfully performed the one-engine-out test over the Rockies. As shown in this dramatic DC-2 test, the plane flew safely with one of its engines deliberately shut down, and the implications for older airplane designs became clear. With the successful completion of the Winslow to Albuquerque test, the uh, 
Tri-Motor was a dead duck for the immediate future. The DC-1 was a prototype. Only one was ever built. It assembled the most advanced innovations of its time into a single design and pointed the way to ever larger commercial transports which held the hopes of profits and growth for the airline industry. I think any really qualified company would have come up with much the same design. Although, of course, I'm sure we did it better than anybody else. <laughs> As TWA readied to buy production models, Donald Douglas suggested a slight design modification to the DC-1. The idea was to stretch the fuselage by almost two feet so that two more seats could be added, bringing the carrying capacity to 14 passengers and giving the airline a chance to make more money. This stretched production model of the DC-1 was designated the DC-2. TWA bought 25 of them and they quickly became popular with passengers for comfort and safety. Amenities included cushioned adjustable seats, good ventilation, dependable steam heat, enough soundproofing for normal conversation, and enough space to carry stewardesses and provide simple cold meals. With speeds up to 175 miles per hour, passengers could now cross the country in 18 hours with only three stops for fuel. The airlines lined up to buy them and the public saw they were a good ship to fly in. On the good ship, lollipop, it's a sweet trip to a candy shop where bonbons play on the sunny beach of Peppermint Bay. Hollywood wasted no time in discovering the DC-2, but the plane's real stardom was secured in the McRobertson Trophy race from England to Australia. On October 20th, 1934, one of KLM's recently purchased DC-2s took off on the 11,000-mile course, flying against sleek racing planes and also the Boeing 247. The DC-2 flew the regular KLM scheduled route, a thousand miles further than the course, and carried several paying passengers. Three days, 18 hours later, it landed in Melbourne, beating the Boeing and coming in second only to a specially built Comet racer. The aviators were heroes, but the true hero was the plane. With its worldwide reputation made, airlines everywhere began to buy them. More people than ever now travel by air, taking advantage of the DC-2's modern speed and comfort. But as a 14-passenger carrier, it still wasn't holding enough people per trip to make profits without the continuing airmail subsidies. Something bigger yet was needed, and the search for the DC-3 was on. There were three passenger carriers flying the long transcontinental routes in the early 30s, and American Airlines was one of them. Using Curtis Condor fabric-covered biplanes, in 1933, American pioneered a sleeper service across the U.S. to gain an edge on competition by offering greater comfort. The Condors had the room to accommodate 14 Pullman-style berths, but they were slow and old-fashioned. At the time of the DC-2, C.R. Smith, shown here with Eleanor Roosevelt, had just begun his 30-year command as president of American Airlines. Together with his chief engineer, Bill Littlewood, he wanted to get rid of the Condors and update the sleeper service. The late Bill Littlewood recalls. C.R. Smith and I went to Donald Douglas and had conversations concerning what might be done to the DC-2 to make it into the kind of an airplane we were seeking. What they envisioned was a larger plane that would be a modern 14-passenger sleeper and, at the same time, could give them the option to carry as many as 21 passengers in a daytime configuration. This would be accomplished by widening the DC-2 fuselage 26 inches to accommodate another row of seats and increasing the wingspan by 10 feet to give the greater lift needed for the plane's additional size and weight. At the time, Donald Douglas was heavily involved with DC-2 production. His initial reaction to Americans' plan was not favorable. Doug was not too enthusiastic about the idea of introducing a new model when our shop was full of orders for DC-2s. But CR convinced him. We told Douglas we'd take the first one to the airplane to develop and pay for him. And that they were very influential. 20 was a big order in those days. 20 was a big order in those days, and 200 would be now. Building began, 
and C.R. Smith collaborated closely with the Douglas Design Department, where Arthur Raymond was now in charge as chief engineer. As the plane took shape, the designers once again incorporated the great sturdiness of the monocoque fuselage, with now even lighter weight aluminum alloys employed in its all-metal stressed skin. The great strength of the multicellular wing and the wind tunnel tested streamlined surfaces to reduce drag and increase speed. Finally, on December 17, 1935, the 32nd anniversary of the Wright brothers' first flight, C.R. Smith got what he and the world's airlines had been hoping for. The first DC-3, the Douglas sleeper transport version, was quietly test flown over the Santa Monica factory. In structure and design, it had the basic excellence of the DC-1 and the DC-2 but it also improved on them. It became the crown jewel of the series. A stronger landing gear would give it more rugged performance on rough airstrips. These newly available 1,000 horsepower engines made it feasible to build a plane whose increased size and weight was a clear impossibility just two years before. The new engines, along with the additional 10-foot wingspan, combined to lift this jumbo wide body of its time with the necessary speed and power to transport people in a new world of comfort and safety, the likes of which had never before been experienced in aviation. Since passenger planes were still not pressurized, flight was limited to 10 or 12,000 feet, where turbulence could still be considerable. As a result, in its design, C.R. Smith had emphasized all aspects of comfort in order to attract passengers. In the daytime version, with its 21 adjustable seats, its sound insulation, its decent steam heating and ventilation, its light colors, its tall ceiling, and in the nighttime sleeper version with its 14 berths, comfort was everything. Your ship flies steadily, smoothly through the quiet of the night. Within the American skysleepers, you have a soft, luxurious berth. It may be a sweltering night for earth dwellers when people sit up all night long because they cannot sleep. But up here, you sleep under blankets. Stewardesses became a routine part of the flying scene to tuck people in physically as well as psychologically. Up here in the skysleeper, you're cozy and warm. You breathe air swept clean by the winds of the world while the purring motors lull you to sleep. See, oh, there. of all people, now how did you get that? Well, Isn't that beautiful? Oh, that brings it all back. This is service that was used on the DC uh, three sleeper. Oh, oh that's, see this. This is that body of the airplane. You you must remember that. That's yes, a but I haven't time. seen it for so many years. Hmm. And a reunion of three of the first American Airlines stewardesses. Yeah. And we served plenty. Them, but it wasn't and they always over. got free cigarettes. Phoebe King got her wings from C.R. Smith in the class of 39 in the days when flying was still something new and special. On Sunday nights when I took my flight out of Chicago, they would have, oh, there were many people behind the fence, and we had to check in over at the hangar and walk across the um, airport to our plane, and as we went by the fence, why they would hand us their autograph books. And then they'd ask us questions, you know, how long does it take to get to Newark and, and uh, all this sort of thing. Lillian Fetty, like her colleagues, had originally trained as a nurse, a requirement for all stewardesses at the time. They wanted uh, capable, <clears throat> trained, disciplined people on the airplane so that if any of the passengers, if it was their first flight or if it was a rough flight, or if they were nervous, uh, we were capable of uh, instilling confidence in them. Air sick? Air, oh, oh, yeah. oh, we don't mention that. Marge Markley began her service on the DC-2s and was there when the DC-3s arrived. There were 21 passengers on the plane if it was full, and most of them uh, were business people that flew uh, maybe five or six times a month, and you really got to know them so it was a very personal type relationship there. Where are we now, Miss We're flying over Dearborn, Michigan. We left Chicago here about an hour ago and flew right along here. 
And now, if you look out the window, you can begin to see Detroit below us. Oh, Barry, look. Yep, there she is. With the galley installed on the DC-3s, hot meals were now available for the first time to the flying public. Fried chicken, mashed potatoes with gravy and peas, and maybe a little salad. That was standard fare. It would be lunch or dinner. DC-3 itself was just a gorgeous plane, and of course we felt that the future was in flying. I think we all felt that because it seemed so luxurious to us that we had food and drink and all those things on it, uh, meaning coffee and soup and these things for the passengers. And um, we felt so secure and safe in this DC-3. The plane's comforts made it a great popular success, but it also became known for its modern instruments and safety. Captain, do you have time to explain the radio being in the control? We fly the highways of the air, Mrs. Cole, the same as you drive the highways on the ground. Ours is a highway of sound. Oh, yes. About two hours ago, we left Chicago here. We are headed for New York here. The Civil Aeronautics Authority maintains radio range stations along the route at frequent intervals, broadcasting a constant highway of sound, which we call the beam. You, uh, there were, you either heard a, an A, dit, da, dit, da, if you were one side of the beam. If you were on the other side of the beam, you got a da, dit, da, dit. When you were right down the groove, as we used to say, you heard this constant hum. Mm -hmm. And uh, listening to that hour after hour became very, very, very tedious. I had no idea. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's quite all right. It's a pleasure to mind. I hope to have you with you again soon. He's nice. I flew the DC-3 as long as any one pilot, many hundreds of hours, and I considered it a, a nice airplane to fly. It was uh, fully controllable in all respects, had excellent stability, perfect response to the controls, and it was just simply uh, no other airplane that uh, competed with it. Well, in general, I'd say the DC-3 was a design you wouldn't want to change anything in. It was exactly what you wanted. The designers loved it. Pilots loved it. Passengers loved it. And especially the airlines loved it. Well, I'm very proud of the DC-3 because it lived, lived up to the best of our expectations and exceeded them. For the first time, there was an airplane with which the airlines could make money without depending upon subsidy. Passenger travel alone. And this is what we'd all been waiting for. By 1939, over 400 had been built. It became the standard of the industry, carrying 80% of domestic passenger traffic and huge numbers elsewhere in the world. While its success worked magic for the airlines, there was truly nothing magic about its design. It was just the shrewd combination of the best available technology at the right time, in the right size of vehicle, with the right performance for the operators of the period. And two, there would soon be so many of them. With America's entrance in the war, in California, the Douglas factory was hard at work with growing orders for military air transports. The DC-3 had so impressed the U.S. Army Air Corps, they decided to use it as a basic troop and cargo carrier. With only slight modifications, a larger cargo door, beefed up floors, a stronger landing gear, the DC-3 went into service as the C-47 in the Army or the R-4D in the Navy and Marine Corps. At peak production, they were manufactured at the rate of two per hour and by war's end, an astounding 10,174 of them were built, opening a new chapter in the way troops and material could be moved during combat. June 6, 1944, D-Day, the greatest fleet of DC-3s ever assembled, making possible the largest air invasion force in history. 20,000 paratroops and supplies carried across the channel in the first 50 hours. Known variously as Sky Troopers, Dakotas, Sky Trains, 1,200 of them flying four abreast in a column 200 miles long. And their solid presence was felt around the world, 
The island hopping campaign in the Pacific would never have been possible without it. The workhorse of the year, whose nicknames Goonie Bird, the Doug, Old Fatso, seemed never to end, moved vehicles, weapons, supplies. It rescued the wounded, and for thousands of GIs, it was the first aircraft they'd ever flown in. With its special talent to take off and land on short, rugged airstrips, the plane was tested to its limits and beyond. The Japanese were coming in at the south end of the city, and the airport was at the north end. And uh, we weren't able to get gas. The gasoline people had left. But uh, while we were there, quite a few Burmese came aboard. When we arrived at Calcutta, we found that our total complement in the cabin was 72. Most of them, of course, small, many babies. And when they opened the baggage compartment, they found four more in there. 76 people on a DC-3. That's a pretty good load. No wonder that by the war's end, Eisenhower would credit the DC-3 as being one of the pieces of equipment most responsible for Allied victory in World War II. In the years following 1945, the many thousands of war surplus DC-3s were converted in great number from military to commercial passenger use. But it wasn't long before the DC-3s were soon passed over by the airlines, which saw greater profits in newer designs, designs which grew out of the DC-3, grew out of its all-metal, streamlined, large-capacity, safety and comfort legacy. It was an era of pressurized planes which could comfortably fly above the weather, could fly faster with higher powered engines and could carry more people. With the advent of jets in the 60s, it seemed certain the DC-3 would die, while only its traditions continued. The last DC-3 was built in 1946, yet strangely today, the plane has lived on to find a niche for itself in the world. For someone with no ability to fix up an old one like the Salernos did with their cargo operation, it's possible to buy virtually new ones in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. DC-3s are for sale at Bassler Flight Service. Warren Bassler's company is refurbishing planes to meet individual needs, whether for cargo or passenger use. The aircraft are restored almost to mint condition, and he's currently doing his 59th DC-3. Strange as it may seem, the demand today is greater than it was when we started in our business 30 years ago. And uh, the airplane is still one of the best airplanes for hauling freight and even hauling people. Uh, it does more for what it costs you to operate than any other airplane you can uh, buy today. Bassler scours the world for DC-3s, most recently buying seven from the French Navy in New Caledonia. We try to find the best airframes that are available, and if you have a clean airframe to start with, the rest is easy. Any signs of corrosion are replaced by new sections, individually cut and fitted, preserving the immense strength of the plane as it was originally designed. In its history, there has never been a structural failure of a DC-3. Interiors are made over completely, down to the last details of new seats, insulation, paneling, reinforced floors. Modern instruments are added, bringing the plane up to date with the latest flying and navigational aids. Finally, with reconditioned engines installed and tested, an almost new DC-3 becomes available to any who want to enter the business. The reason that we stay in the DC-3 business is because of the cost being uh, 175000 to 300000 for a freighter ready to go for someone starting in the freight business versus a couple million for anything else that would uh, do the job for them. It's 5 a.m. in Hyannis, Massachusetts, and Provincetown Boston Airlines' fleet of four different types of airplanes sits out in the Cape Cod grass like a flock of birds awaiting its mid-morning activity. Passengers leaving Hyannis for Boston or Provincetown, Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket may be surprised to find they're going to be flying in an airplane designed 50 years ago. But the DC-3s are an essential part of PBA's fleet, and it was no matter of chance that the company's founder, John Van Arsdale, began buying them back in 1968. I never bought an airplane in the history of my operation of the company because I liked it. I bought an airplane because I thought it could make money. The DC-3 fulfills that objective. We didn't pay a great deal of money for them, and therefore we could afford to park them and operate them uh, whenever they were needed. Today, PBA flies 12 DC-3s along with three other types of aircraft, and scheduling is done according to demand. 
The right size plane is dispatched for the right size load. Uh, Operation Central. The dispatcher's pet names for the planes help relieve the frantic pace of scheduling. Uh, due to the overload, uh, we'll use a DC-3 to Boston. Uh, we'll give them Dragon Wagon service. After we bought a DC-3 for about $20,000, we might put fifty or 100000 into it. But we had a great airplane for $120,000, $150,000. Completely redid them all over. And uh, when it flew, it made money. Chief pilot Anthony Fritas is performing a routine inspection of this plane before going aloft, examining the entire exterior for any possible surface irregularities. It's a standard procedure for any plane, but this plane is special. 36 PB here is the highest time DC-3 in the world. Uh, it's the highest time airliner in the world. It's got over 88,000 hours on it right now. It passed the one that's hanging in the Smithsonian some time ago. Every time it goes out, it sets a new record. Uh, it's sort of the queen of the fleet to us. It's uh, our pride and joy. For PBA, it's, it's really the perfect airplane for our operation. We generally fly shorter legs than the major airlines do, so the fact that the airplane's half the speed or less of a, of a modern jet doesn't really bother us. The trip length is still only going to be a half an hour. We don't suffer at all there. And the airplane gives us the ability to take 30 people at a whack out of a, a very small field that, that uh, any other airplane just wouldn't allow us to do. In a modern jet, uh, you cruise anywhere from something in the area of 30,000 feet. And in a DC-3, we're generally cruising at about a tenth of that altitude. So you're a lot closer to the ground. There's a lot more scenery down there. Generally, it's a lot more enjoyable to fly down at that altitude. You, you fly uh, from here to Boston, and if you fly over a football field, you've got time to see a play beyond the fact that it's a football field that might be down there from 30,000 feet. You don't just sit in a DC-3 and let things happen. and. Uh, for sheer activity in the cockpit, I guess there is quite a bit more than there would be in a 727 or something of that nature. The gear is a good example. Um, 727, if you want to put the gear down, you throw one lever down. And a DC-3, you have to throw uh, one hydraulic lever down, wait for the pressure to build up in the gauges, and then throw a lock latch in place, return the hydraulic lever to the center position. And then for the heck of it, you stick your head out the window and make sure it's stuck down. You try that in a 727, you lose your head. The plane is flown at 155 miles per hour, and with the Boston runway in view, speed is cut to 95, enabling it to land in one-tenth the space needed for a modern jet. Well, the airplane was built to fly at uh, a slower speed. As a result, it's always being affected by the environment, by the winds that are on the airport itself, or by a jet blast from a passing airplane or something, whereas a modern airplane, a 727, once it's on the ground, essentially becomes a truck. You start steering it. This airplane, you've got to fly continually all the way to the gate and shut down the engines and wait for them to lock the controls before you give it up as an airplane. There is no airplane today that will replace it for what we use it for on a short haul out of a short airport. There's nothing that even comes close. And any airplane that can do what this thing does and did for the airlines and for us is just, there's no question it's a superior aircraft. After 50 years, more than 1,000 DC-3s are still flying the skies of the world. DC-3 has been called a very well-loved airplane. I think that comes about through the fact that there were so many of them, and so many people have experienced travel in the DC-3, some of it under rather arduous and dangerous conditions, and come through unscathed. So there are a lot of stories that accumulate about the good old DC-3, the Goonie Bird, uh, and so forth, with a feeling of affection. Also, you kind of feel affection for somebody that's as old as a DC-3. <laughs> I hope. 